Check. Testing. Can you hear me? Okay. Welcome to Arizona Deliverance Center, hosting Hardcore Christianity. My name's Joe. Before I turn you over to our speaker, um, let me just please permit me to get through a few announcements. So I want to, you want me to speak up? Okay. Um, so I want to encourage everybody who wants to accelerate their deliverance to get a copy of Brother Mike's Miracle List, and that'll weaken the spirits that are holding you back. It'll um, take you through repentance and forgiveness, and it'll get you started on renewing your mind. And all of you who are in here and those watching online, I encourage you also to get a copy of uh, Satan's Counterattack because the enemy will try, especially within the first 48 hours, to try to steal your blessing. That's not uncommon for people to lose their blessing, and it's subsequently more difficult after that. So I encourage you to do that. If you follow those instructions, you will not lose your blessing. Um, Brother Mike's Miracle List can be accessed on the top of the webpage of hardcorechristianity.com. And the Satan's Counterattack article is found on the teachings page. Um, also important, uh, it's going to take a little longer than getting through the miracle list. In fact, it's going to take your whole life. That's renewing your mind. And uh, you can get started by availing yourself to tonight's teaching. But we also offer a lot of services that you can check out on the calendar page. And um, we also have a... Um, there's an app for your phone you can find on Google Play and um, the App Store for Apple phones, Apple products. And when you download, just check out Hardcore Christianity and get that app, and you'll find some, some information on there that'll keep you updated when our services are. So I'm just going to go through a few of them. Uh, for details, check out the calendar page. And um, that'll give you times for teaching, preaching, healing, deliverance. Uh, the radio broadcasts, out-of-town events. Um, actually, tomorrow, well, actually, it's, I don't think it's going to be online anyway. Mike's in uh, California. I think it's Carlsbad. Um, he's got a deliverance service there. Um, so to start off, we on Sundays, we have Brother Mike's podcast at 9 a.m. And that's the deep things of God. Tuesdays, we have Julie's, uh, it's a women's ministry, it's called Steps to Freedom. It's at 6.30 p.m., and it's also accessible through Zoom Deliverance. And we have, um, oh, the access code and passcode, uh, email Mike, Mike at hardcorechristianity.com, or there's contact information at the top of the website. We have... Zoom deliverance for men and women on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And that's um, the access code and passcode for that is found on the Facebook group called Steps of Deliverance. And that's uh, Zoom deliverance is maintained by Rick Cott. And he starts off with a great teaching followed by deliverance with uh, Rick Cott and Stephanie Bradfield from Alabama Thursdays. And Fridays, we have regular services at 7 p.m. Um, if you're coming early, if you're coming on Friday, please come a few minutes early to join us for the Glossa Choir at 6.45. That helps us to usher in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Saturdays, we have a few things that we offer. The first Saturday of August coming up is the Children's Deliverance. That's August, it's going to be August 5th at 10 a.m. for preteens only. And, of course, your guardians must be there also, the guardians. And the fourth Saturday of every month is the Deliverance Training with Brother Mike. That's at noon. So it's a couple hours of teaching followed by deliverance. Let's see, we have... Um, Oh, we also have, we offer one-on-one -on -one counseling for free for born-again Christians. If you're visiting from out of town, please sign up two to three weeks in advance for that so it lines up with your schedule. 
and incidentally, we're all volunteers here, but we do have expenses for maintenance, repairs, upkeep, and so forth. And as long as Mike's been running this, this um, facility, we've never been laid on a bill thanks to your offering. So thank you so much for supporting this ministry. If you feel led, we do have offering boxes attached to the doors of the large and small sanctuary. Now, if you want to expand your ministry in deliverance and healing, uh, we maintain a bookstore. We offer well over a dozen items in there that'll, that'll help, you out, help you out with your, either your personal deliverance but also your, your own ministry. I encourage you to access two books. You can also get them online on Amazon and read it on your Kindle app. The first one is Plano Spirits. The Root Cause and Cure to Mental Illness, written by Mike W. Smith, who also wrote Atonement Healing, which bifurcates healing and deliverance when it's appropriate to use one or the other or both. And I think I got m most of the announcements. Um, if for any other details, um, you know, what platforms are offered on Facebook, YouTube, just check out the calendar page. Okay, I'm going to enter into prayer if you care to join me. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. It is only through his finished work, his atonement, that we have been reconciled to you. And that we can call his Father and his God our Father and our God. Lord God, you called us to repent and believe the gospel. But we can't repent on our own. It is a free gift. Lord God, we ask that you give us godly sorrow. You've given it to us, but we ask for more that godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow, which produces death, but godly sorrow which leads to repentance. It produces repentance leading to salvation and deliverance not to be regretted. Father God, we, we thank you for the anointing that breaks the yoke. We thank you for the authority that you gave Christ Jesus, that he gave to us. Lord Jesus, we who are born again and spirit-filled, thank you for baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we thank you that we can believe your word, your gospel, good tidings, salvation, grace, not with our own faith, but the faith that you gave us because you are the author and finisher of our faith. Father God, we desire to bear fruit, good fruit. But first, we need our ground repair, uh, prepared for the word that David Baldwin is about to sow in our hearts. His message grounded in truth, grounded in your word. So prepare our hearts, Lord God, right now. Fill the valleys of humiliation. Bring the hills and mountains of pride low. Make, it, make the crooked places of misunderstanding straight. The rough places of defensiveness and guardedness and fear. Smooth those out, Lord. That this message that we receive tonight And the word that is sown may fall on good ground, that it may bear fruit. Fruit that you can prune, that it may bear more fruit. So anoint our eyes and our ears and the words of our speaker. Let them be seasoned with salt and grace. We thank you for the deliverance, the healing, 
the revelations, the knowledge, the wisdom, the exhortation, the instructions and in righteousness that we may all be, pre be prepared for every good work. And all this we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. That, my friends, is evidence of someone who spends time in prayer. Praise God. We're going to do something a little bit different to start off tonight, so bear with me. It's going to be a blessing, and God put this on my heart, and I'm like, hey, it's kind of awkward. You know that little back and forth? By the way, my name is David. Hello. And but then you just kind of feel that little tugging. I, okay, Lord. All right. And then you start to barter. Three minutes, not five. Okay. And then I'm good. And then he starts to tug a little bit more. Okay, Lord. Five minutes. All right. You got it. The Bible says, "Be still and know that I am God." Amen. And He is that still small voice. And there's some things that can only happen in a moment of holy reverence. If you've ever been to a sporting event or a large gathering where someone has passed and they take a moment of silence to remember someone, that, that it transcends that moment, does it not? And so what I'm going to do, what I'm going to lead you in is five minutes Silence. And the point is to get past that initial urge and the thoughts to recount what happened this week or what you're going to do tomorrow or why you're here or what is he talking about or what did he say or or I got to do this. Well, I better, I better make a note in my phone. No, not allowed. It takes a good two minutes just to get out of that place of busyness. And so we're going to shut them off, turn them down. And what your job is is once you get past that mental traffic and the noise and the sound, is to realize and be aware, be intentional of God's presence in and around you. Amen? Amen. He's in us, right? If we believe, we've opened the door, he knocked, and we opened the door, he came in, he said, I will be with you. Amen? And we know his spirit is everywhere, so he's here. So your eyes closed, minds quiet, and this is not prayer. This is not praying for someone or something. This is you being a child of God, just being. And you know what? So often we get caught up in doing and I need to say the right thing and I need to do this and how do I pray and what should I do or what do I need to do and you know what that stuff's great and that stuff saves souls and that stuff builds buildings and that stuff advances humanity and brings forth the kingdom but God loves you for who you are and he just wants to be with you if you've ever had a loved one that was dying or was ill just to be there with them and hold their hand. Ministered to you. Moved you to tears. That's what God wants. So, we're going to start right now.
Lord Jesus, let us be reminded of the call to a pure and simple devotion to Jesus Christ. To not miss the main thing. To not miss you. The time with you. Connecting with you. Being with you. Fellowshipping with you. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, but I am afraid as a serpent deceived ease by his cunning, you too may be led astray from a pure and simple devotion to Jesus Christ. How many needed that? How many? Don't just raise your hands for me. I, I don't need platitudes. How many of you needed that? Amen. How many? The first two minutes was hard. Isn't that hard? Isn't that funny? But then after that, how many? The last three minutes was like, it was so sweet. And I used to force myself to do that. And, and I had to force myself and I had to lie down on the ground and and just to throw my phone and put a paper bag, just kidding, and just to do it. But then I, the five minutes would be up. I couldn't wait for the five minutes to be up, but then the five minutes would be up, and I would, I would hit a snooze. And I would just, because there's something about that. Your soul needs that. You need that. You, you need that. If there's anything that can be said about our society today, it's a lot of noise. Constant noise. There's some people that can't cope without noise. Doesn't matter what it is. Gotta have the radio on. Gotta have the TV on. Gotta have the fan on. Gotta... Gotta have, gotta talk. <laughs> I've been there. Boy, this is awkward. Two guys riding in a truck. Well, I'm gonna say something. This is odd. What are you just gonna do? Sit here and stare out the window? And there's there's something about it. But you know, it's 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 that for me was laden in insecurity. I wanted to talk because I wanted to help control. Holy Spirit showed this to me. I wanted to kind of dictate the conversation so I could set the tone and the pace so I could kind of help control the outcome by talking. I could, I could choose the subject matter. I could choose the points of discussion, things that I'm comfortable with. I could avoid things that I'm not, not comfortable with. Because I was insecure. So I wanted to talk. Amen? How many been there? And, and I, I didn't have peace with myself that I could just be there and look like a, you know, whatever you look like when you're sitting in a truck. Like a dope. Or the coolest guy. Or the ugliest or the best. You know, who knows? Everyone's going to have a different opinion. But what matters is what you're going on in your head and you're wondering what other people are thinking about you. And so if you're not careful, then you begin to cultivate your, uh, your words and your actions outside of that based on what somebody else might be thinking. And then the enemy's got you. <laughs> He's got you reeling. Amen. If there's anything the world needs now, it's, it's the gift of shut up. We need a giant, God's got to have one, he just hasn't used it yet. A giant mute button, amen, on humanity. I mean, you know, we get frustrated with all the insanity and asinine and the, the foolishness that is out there. I mean, he's got to be like, you know, God sits in the heavens and he laughs. He's like, oh my goodness, what are they going to come up with next? 
And if we're not careful, we get caught up in the commotion, the noise. And then if we're not careful, then we kind of put our guard down and we may not be aware of what's being said about us and what we're allowing in and what we're meditating our thoughts on. And the worst is what you say. That's the worst. They say, be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little eyes what you see. That ain't nothing. Be careful little mouth what you say. That's when the rubber meets the road. Who cares what you see and what you hear? The Holy Spirit sees it all, hears it all, not phased. He's cool as a cucumber. And guess what? You're born again. You got the Holy Spirit in you. You can walk through that valley. You can go out on that street. You can witness on Skid Row. You can see things happening and not be phased because you've got the Holy The Holy Spirit's not phased. <laughs> There's no surprises. It's not... Now, yeah, we don't want to be up all night watching porn, right? And listening to derogatory, defamatory music and all that sort of stuff. And, and, you know, we should be careful. But I'm saying the main thing is not what you hear, what you see. It's what you say. That's when the rubber meets the road. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For each person is tempted by the desires that are within. We each have things that we like or want, like I was saying earlier, uh, being that awkward silence and wanting to dictate conversations so I could control and be uh, comfortable with what was being said and minimize the chance of rejection. So I took that bait, that desire to be liked or to be accepted or to mitigate or minimize rejection so I would talk. There's, there was a desire in there. There's desires in us that aren't necessarily good for us. You guys know that because you're here. Amen. <laughs> That's nothing new. But desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And so it's not just what we think of sin as we think of it as an action. We think of, oh, they murdered. But there's also you shall not covet. And of course, we know Jesus raised the bar and it's like, okay, what's going on in here? But when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do you see the cycle? So there's a desire, there's something inside of you, let's call it a weakness, that the enemy wants to exploit. God wants to help. He wants to be God in your life and to help you overcome that. And you just come to him and say, I got an issue, I got a problem, I got a need. And he says, hey, you confess it, you come, I'll help you. I'll show myself mighty to save, amen? That's that. If we didn't have those needs, we wouldn't need God. That would be sad. Some of the greatest faith that you will see is in third world countries, poor people, because they don't know where the next meal is going to come from. They don't have the money. They don't have. But thanks be to God for that, because we have a need for him. Amen. Amen. And so what we see is happening with the noise as part of it, the words that are used, it is a war of words. Spiritual battle, the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness, if it is anything, it is a war of words. It is so crucial. God formed the universe. By his word. He spoke 
And it happened. The first temptation. Did God say? Calling into question words. Jesus calling forth miracles and telling the, the waves of the sea to stop. Be still. Lazarus, come out! Words. Those are words. Words is, is what did it. If you confess with your mouth, everyone who calls. Now, that was before phone. So we know that is not a phone call. Amen. It's not 1-800-TBN. That is a legitimate, you're, save me, Lord. Words. How's Jesus going to defeat the enemies at the end of time? A sharp, two-edged sword. What is, what is this like? Marvel Comics? No, it's the Word. It's truth. Just like the devil, he said, you have been a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And he's going to crumble like a deck of cards. Because the truth is going to cut him down. It's words. It's all about the words. Amen? Amen? And if we're not careful, we get caught up in the war of words, and we can lose the war of words. If you don't believe me that it's a war of words, There's a war of words that is going on. Love is love. That is the dumbest definition I've ever heard. <laughs> black is black. White is white. What, that doesn't help me at all. That is, that is no help. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Love is love, dude. Wow. Whoa. We didn't even have to make it a 420 afternoon for that. Wow. Dude, we should make t-shirts. Love is love. Who could argue with that? I will. God is love. That's the truth. God is love. Sorry for yelling at you. I'm a little excited. Don't take it personal. What, is, what, is that, what do they want? See no evil, hear no evil. You turn a blind eye to what I'm doing in my sin, and I'll turn a blind eye to yours. Acceptance. Love is not acceptance. If there's a bridge out at the end of the road, would you tell a person? Well, maybe not an in-law, but would you tell someone you cared about? Right? Because you love them. The bridge is out. If you went to a doctor and you had a nail in your intestine, would you want him to tell you the truth? Yeah, you'd want him to help you. And how many know there's been times when God has put something on your heart where you put your neck on a line to say something to someone because you cared about them and you knew it may not be received and you knew you may not ever see them again, but you felt like you had to, even though you didn't want to, but you told them the truth in love because you were trying to help them. And how many know God did that throughout the Bible? Love is not love. God is love. It's a war of words. It's manipulation. If you don't agree with Black Lives Matter, oh, you're a racist. Oh, you're, you're, then, you're, then you don't agree that Black Lives Matter. No, that's not what I said. It's not that simple. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a trick. It's a ploy. So they can demonize you and twist words and manipulation and label you so they can get their way. Because if I'm pointing out something that you're doing, you're less likely to look at me. They're stealing. Well, this guy would never steal because he's helping us catch people that are stealing. 
That's psychologically, subconsciously, that's how we think. No, love is love. I love you. I love all people. Well, they, w- they couldn't be hateful because they're saying love is love. Be careful. You can't judge a book by its cover. It goes both ways. There it is, the small one there. Women's rights are human rights. Oh, last time I checked, a fetus was a human. So you see how asinine that is? But if you're not careful and you're, okay, yeah. And there's some well-meaning, good-intentioned people that love God that have fallen prey to the war of words. Say, aren't we supposed to help people? Don't black lives matter? Don't people have free will and freedom of choice? And isn't that their body? Yeah, well, they're hurting another body inside that body that they're supposed to protect, and God put that body there. And if you want to deal with God, I fear for you. And we need more women who have gone through abortion to speak up and don't be ashamed and embarrassed and allow the devil to zip your lip so that the word gets out there of how damaging and emotionally distressing it is when you realize 10, 15, 20 years later what you actually did. We need more testimonies about that. There's a reason why most abortions are by first-time moms. I think I read that stat. I'm not a stat junkie, so I could have gotten that wrong. But there's a high percentage, there you go, of women. It's their first one. I think it's like 43%. Why? The trauma. Who wants to do that again? I'm going to say it again. We need more women who will be unashamed and will tell the truth and shame the devil that they fell prey to the attack of the devil or they were forced to or told to or said they had no other option and they have lived through that horror for decades. They still smell the smell. They still see it. They wonder what would they have looked like. What would they have been doing with their lives? You want someone to be tormented? Have them abort a fetus. That's their own. That is the definition of tormenting. So why do they do it? Love, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. God is love. The New Testament is excellent because it's so rich and it's so relevant, and it has Jesus and all that is entailed with Christ and and. But I love the Old Testament character stories because you see how people interacted and lived and and the ebb and flow with God. And you don't have to look far to see God's heavy hand or stern hand. Spare the rod, spoil the child. We got little kids at home and, oh my goodness, it's like trying to stop fireworks. Or they say like trying trying to corral cats. It's like nearly impossible. And, and, and we tell them what to do. And I don't, we're so smart. I don't, and we're so much older and wiser. I don't know why they just don't do it. It's the darndest thing. And then we explain it to them and they still don't do it. And there's something, you know, we take them to the doctor, get their hearing checked. No, they can hear. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, now we've now we got issues, okay. And you explain it to them. That doesn't matter. And then you yell at them. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it don't. 
And then sometimes you got to, I like a slap on the wrist and a pop on top of the head. Boom. Come on. Think. Then sometimes, when the a paddle, boom. And I will tell him, I say, I'm going to start yelling at you. I will yell at you if you don't do that. And it, what's my point? There's no doubt I love my child. I want what's best for my child and my children. And sometimes it takes tough love. And sometimes it's, it's hard. And God gives us a spanking. And he gives us a timeout. And he puts us in jail and puts us in prison and, and, and we go bankrupt and, and we get sick or whatever it is, for whatever rhyme or reason. But God chastens those he loved. He says, what father wouldn't do that? It's the one that doesn't discipline their children is the one that doesn't love their children. They're being lazy or selfish. Amen? Just, oh, let them do whatever they want. No, God is love. And sometimes it's tough love. And tough love doesn't mean it's not God. Amen? And the truth hurts sometimes. But if you've got an open cut, do you want what feels good? Or do you want something that's going to clean it out and prevent infection? Same thing I tell my kids. Okay, you can have this rubbing alcohol now. And it's going to sting. Will it sting? Yes, it's going to sting. Okay. Well, you think that stinks? Well, we get an infection in there. (laughs) And the doctor has to pop it out. I I I clipped a barrel cactus one time and I got I had a hole in my toe and I didn't know it. I had a little hole in my big toe and I didn't know it, and sure enough, it got infected. And then sure enough, I saw a red dot on my foot. And then I saw it moving and going up. Holy cannoli. (laughs) Not good. A little bit of antiseptic, even though it stung, would have been a lot better than going to the hospital while on vacation, especially in California. That's the one I should have left my wallet at home. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, what does he mean? If men are fighting and a woman who is pregnant gets hit and the baby is birthed prematurely, there's no harm. He should be punished accordingly. But if any harm follows, verse 23, Exodus 21, then you should give life for life. It's a life. The baby in there is a life. This is where we get eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He's talking about pregnant women and protecting them. Free will runs out at the abortion clinic. When you walk in that door and they do that procedure, that's when you went past free will. It wasn't in there. It wasn't for you to do that. Yeah, you have a choice and a right, but you're going to have to answer for it. And God's mercy and God's grace is bigger than that. Amen. His blood is more powerful than blood that's been shed for murderers. Moses, David, Saul, we could go down the line. But saying that that is not a human is not correct. It's a lie. And if you believe that, then you're losing the war of words. And if you're just taking everything that you hear in culture and you're regurgitating it out now you guess what you've been promoted you're a soldier in the war of words against the kingdom of god not good there are six things that the lord hates seven that are an abomination haughty eyes a lying tongue there it is words hands that shed innocent blood A false witness, again, words. And one who sows discord, words. Three of those seven, words. (laughs) 
I, I've, I haven't seen this uh, horse in a <laughs> before. You guys know what this is? It's a Trojan horse, right? Oh, it's a gift. Oh, they love me. They're trying to help me. They want what's best for me. They're going to give me a benefit. They're going to give me a blessing. They're going to pay it back. They're not going to tell on me. I won't tell on them. You already told on yourself. <laughs> you are, God already saw it. You're, the Trojan horse. It's a Trojan horse. For those of you who don't know the story, it's, you know, mythology is believed. The city of Troy and they rolled in this wooden horse because they couldn't get in. They couldn't overtake the city. And then when it got into the city and, uh, you know, all these soldiers came out and just demolished the city. So what looked like on the outside, oh, it's a gift. Oh, they're, oh, you're so nice. You're telling me all these great things about myself. There might be a bad guy inside. Hebrews, when he uh, chastens those, the believers because they should have been teachers and they were still on milk, they should have been eating meat, he said, through practice, through trials, having your gift of discernment trained through constant practice, constant discernment. You, you can't just take it for what it's worth. You can't just believe everything you hear because they'll, they'll get you. They'll get you good. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Like, it ain't cool. It's not good. So the question begs to be asked, what, what, are, you, what are the words that we're using or misusing And I'll tell you right now, the primary target is yourself. The truth is, you were made in the image and likeness of God, that he knew you before you were born, that he knit you together in your mother's womb, that he knows the hairs on your head, and he cares for you more than any, greater than your little heart could ever imagine. And he's so in love with you that he gave his life. So what's the value of your life? It's his life. I'm going to say that again. He loved you so much that he gave his life. So in God's eyes, the value of your life is nothing less than his son. So when we're caught in the war of words and we say things like, I'm not good enough. Whoa. Whoa. I'm not smart enough. I'm not gifted enough. It's too late. I went too far. I've gone too far. I can't do it. We're losing the war of words. See, if you, if the enemy can get you to repeat those things about yourself, he got you. I am sick. Now, we all get sick. Don't get me wrong. But there's a difference between Getting sick and being sick. I am a addict. I am addicted to versus I am struggling with an addiction. The second person is a step ahead of the first person. I am insane. I am mentally ill. I am gay. I am queer. Versus I am struggling with There's a big difference. And if the enemy can convince you to identify with 
our sinful nature or the trauma of our past or the things we're struggling with, it, it, we're stuck. We're, we're there. That's it. You know, and it's not all she wrote, and that's not the end of the story. And tomorrow's a new day, and God's mercies are new every morning. Amen. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. But if that is your mentality, and you've believed the lie, and that's who you say you are, how can you be anything different? Our words have the power to ratify or rebuke the thoughts and words that are spoken into our lives. You are either ratifying them by agreeing, agreeing them or you're rebuking them. And the worst thing is if you repeat them. I'm not good enough. I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have enough money. It's too late. I'm a drug addict. You're losing the war of words. When Moses was going to go to Pharaoh, what did God say to do? He said, tell them I am that I am. Those are two very powerful, almost, I would say, sacred or holy words. And for you to say, I am, and to fill that in with something other than what God's holy word says about you is a sin. It's wrong. And you are taking the devil's ammo and you're shooting yourself with it. You know, homosexuality, for example, something happens in someone's life, usually when they're young, abuse, obviously, usually by the same sex. They get older, that thought comes back. They got, the devil starts whispering. He's the one that's stirring up the thoughts, stirring up the reminders, the fiery darts. He's stirring it up. They feel a little funny here. They're a little curious there. They do a little something here, do a little something there. And then the enemy comes in and says, yeah, you are. You've always been. You, you put on your mom's dress. You used to pull your shirt in like a... What kid doesn't do that crap? Right? But the enemy crafts a narrative with words. And he cherry picks. It's so not fair. He cherry picks moments in a person's life. And they say, well, that wouldn't happen to you unless you were gay. You're gay. Same thing in the garden. Well, you'll be wise like God. Don't you want to be wise? He throws up the kind of the uncertainty, but then he closes it with a hard sell. Don't you want to be God? Don't you want to be? Yeah, you want to be. <laughs> you know? Oh, you, you are. It's a war of words. That's why it's important to speak the truth in your children. Every single day you lay your, your eyes on their beautiful face. You speak it. You speak the truth of who they are and what it is to be a boy and what it is to be a girl. And you encourage that. Don't get caught up in this PC world. You encourage that. You be rough. You tumble. You jump. Now, I tell my son. There's a way to treat another boy, and there's a way to treat girls. Treat girls differently. And I tell him, I say, pick on somebody your own size. Come pick. You want to tease your little sisters? Come tease me. We can, we can do that. We can tease. We can have fun with it. Those are fun friendships when you can tease. But don't pick on someone smaller than you, and don't pick on the girls, amen. Treat them. You know, open the door. You're supposed to look out for them. We need to speak the truth into those around us. I, one of the best blessings I ever had is I had fallen in lust with someone. And they were a train wreck and much short of a paycheck. And someone said, David, 
you, you're meant for so much more than that. You don't want that. God's got more for you. They didn't demean this other person. They didn't challenge me. It wasn't a tug of war or a war of wills against, you know, what I thought and, and this person and me. It was like they spoke to me. They said, you are worth more. You can do it. There is life inside of you. And as long as you're living, there's hope. Amen. And if God be for you, who can be against you? And whom shall you fear? And if he's begun a good work in you, he is faithful to finish it until the day of completion. That is the truth. Amen. He's got a calling for you. He's got a gifting. He's got a purpose that he can make all things work together for good. That is the truth. Amen. And there's no sin that is too great for the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Amen. You have not gone too far or done too much for Jesus for that to fall short. Don't tell me that. The genuine repentant heart, the blood has got you covered. And he's got a purpose for you. I know a man that told his friend, no, I don't want to go to church today. No, I don't want to go to church today. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday into his 50s, into his late 50s. Well, it was raining one day. Even in Phoenix, Arizona, it does rain. We could use some rain right now, hallelujah. Open up the windows, Ed. And so, finally, he's like, okay, I'll go. Maybe He's probably thinking, let me just get this guy off my back. So he goes. Sits in the back row. The devil's probably telling him, he ain't good enough to sit up close, right? So he's sitting in the back row. Service goes on. Does the preacher does the altar call. And he just is overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. And he's crawl, uh, crying, bawling. He falls on the floor. The church is emptied out. He has no idea what's happening. This is all foreign. He didn't grow up in the church. He's an old man. He's, you know, he could, he's thinking about retiring in the next 10 years. He's, you know, the church is cleared out. He can't even speak intelligibly. He's, he's speaking in tongues. He get, back, he get the whole shebang right off day one. Praise the Lord. The preacher comes up and he says, what's going on? And then my friend and this and this is what's going on. He explains it to him, what's happening to him. Well, that seems like eons ago, but 15 years later, he's got a cancer ministry, and he's walked thousands of people from being uh, diagnosed with cancer and all the way to healing. He was old. He was lost. But God had more to say. Amen? There's always more. This, this one, the war of words. You go fight in a foreign country with a foreign God, and they look at you, and they say, you an infidel. And there's something empowering, and I think, you know, this goes back to the homosexuality thing, too, I think. You know, there's something empowering when you just say, okay, all right, you say that about me, I'm going to rock it. And I'll be the worst or best infidel, or I'll be the worst or best homosexual you ever seen. And there's something about, it's empowering. And we see it with people who are promiscuous, that coming out of abuse. Because, uh, you, you know, it's like, this was taken from me. But if, 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 if I call the shots, if I control it, now I'm empowered. And now, I, you know, I can dictate my terms. Women, women caught in sex trafficking and dancing and things like that. They're taking that sexuality and they're using it. They're becoming empowered by it. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to who I want to It's not going to be taken from me. I'm going to give it to who I want to give. And, and I'm going to make this and charge this and do that. Well, I'll, I'll be an infidel. You're dang right I'm an infidel. You hate me, I hate you. And they embrace it, but they, it's like the devil got them. Again, they're taking the ammo of the devil and they're shooting themselves. They're not infidels. Not necessarily. And that, you know, it's like, dang it, the devil got him. The devil got him. They identify with it. Here's the real definition. Here's the truth. Unfaithful. Unfaithful. 
Animist is popular right now. The belief that everything is spiritual. Rocks are spiritual. Trees are spiritual. Stars are spiritual. This is the definition of an infidel. And somebody gets that tattooed on their forearm or back or puts a sticker on their... This is what they're identifying with. You can't just change the meanings of the names. <laughs> you can't do it. I'm sorry. When you, I was thinking about I was getting ready tonight, and this example came to me. In the Old Testament, when something happened, and someone did a sacrifice, or there was a victory, or someone was an idiot, or whatever, they would name that place or that person because of what they did. Right? His wife, his name is Nabal because he's a fool. <laughs> Then we call this place Gilgal. Gilgal means circle because we can't, or whatever it is. And, you know, this means this. And, you know, there's a reason why the words came about, and you can't just change them. If you are changing the definition of words because you feel empowered or you feel like, oh, I'm going to take it back and I'm going to use it for me and it's going to be cool and we're going to be bros, you have fallen prey to the schemes of the devil. The eye of the lamp, your eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness or be shaded. Be shaded, shady. One of the best prayers, if not the best prayer, besides asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins that I've ever prayed is, Lord, search me like a floodlight. Show me. 11 years antipsychotic medicines, waking up, realizing that I was in a straight, back, straight jacket. I was a prisoner of war in the devil's camp, and there was no way I was getting out unless I learned how to fight. Amen. The devil had me right, right where he wanted me. And I said, Lord, search me like a floodlight. You know that, that bright floodlight, like, phew, or like, you know, the cop light that, you know, shines and casts light on everything and it lights up the whole yard. Like, that's what I want the Holy Spirit to do inside of here. That I want to know if there be any crooked way in me. I want to know if there be any impure motive. I want to know. I want to get it right. He's done so much for me and he's forgiven me so much and I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve an ounce of the grace that he gave me and the mercy and the love. I didn't deserve any of it and he did it for me nonetheless. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I, I don't want to disappoint him and I don't want to let him down and I don't want anything. You give the, the don't even give him an inch. I don't want that little thing in there, that little thing that you're holding on to, that little thing that you turn a blind eye to, that little thing, right, that hidden thing, that called the, the sin that clings so closely is so comforting. It, it's it just like, you just like to, I was, you know, in, uh, in Hebrews 12, let us lay aside every weight in the, Sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us. I always picture like this little lap cat. It's just like this fluffy cat is this, this sin, this pet sin that clings so closely. It just feels good. It's, it's soothing. It's comforting. I don't want that. I want to get that stuff worked out now. I don't want to get there and then have him say, I didn't know you. Why did this? And I, I doesn't matter. I didn't have a relationship. You were just busy. You were just running around. You were just doing it to doing it because you saw it and then you were supposed to do it and you did it. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want to lose the war of words. I want to use my words to set me free. Lord, search me like a floodlight. Lord, show me impure motives. Show me the way. You know, we're, we're having something we're working through in our family. I told you guys about this rental. We're trying to, you know, get some things to work. And, and, and I had to humble myself. And I realized I was being proud. If God can't show you that you're proud, and I'm not saying this to boast. If anyone boasts, let me boast that you know it's the Lord. Amen. I'm saying that, I'm saying that 
if God can't show you that you're proud, you're, you're not going to get any help. <laughs> proud people don't get help. They don't ask for help. I don't like to ask for help. I'm a man. I want to do it myself. If you want it done right, do it yourself. Amen? Oh, I might be losing the word of words on that one. Lord, if there's any shade, if there's any darkness, if there's anything that's blocking or stealing the light, I want to know. The weeds use the same nutrients, minerals, and sunlight as the fruit-bearing plants. The weeds, they grow faster. The same things. It looks like life. It's green, but it's a weed. And it's stealing the light from the things that need it. Trojan horse right here. What's wrong with this song? Bingo. The devil got him on that one. Calling a spade a spade. I'm sure he's a good guy, loves the Lord. Not related. This is my big brother, Josh. For those of you who don't know, my name, last name is Baldwin, by the way. I'd rather be associated with him than Alec, though. So I'll take, I'll take Josh in the my, my, my fear. Oh, like, like you mean like my car, my wife, my house, my job, my fear? Like it goes in that category that's something you carry around with you and you ride in and you identify with? My fear. Oh, oh. well, like, you know what? It's going to be your fear. Because you ain't getting rid of it if it's yours. <laughs> if you say my fear, that's it. My anxiety. My worries. There's a difference in saying my fear and I am fearful of or I am struggling with fear or I am working through anxiety or I am, you know, there's a different thing. Like one is your identity. The other one is like, okay, there's an indicative of there's a tug of war going on, a battle. Like Paul said, you know, my flesh wants to do this. My spirit wants to do that. Like he's like, hey, man, this is a real tug of war. But when you say it's yours, my anxiety, my depression, my illness, my addiction, my diagnosis, that you're, again, you're taking the words of the enemy and you're using them to shoot yourself. Be careful, little lips, what you say. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. That's, it's the final frontier. Your, your tongue is the final frontier. If you get that thing worked out, in shape, whipped up, disciplined, in line with the word of God and what it should be doing and saying, you, 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 that's it. It's not the drugs, it's not the temptation, it's not the trauma, it's not the wounds, it's not the abuse, it's not the doctors, it's not the spouses, it's not the kids, not the in-laws, it's your tongue. That is the, the pinnacle. If you can bridle that, you can bridle your whole body. I used to smoke cigarettes, I'm ashamed to say it. And the funny thing is, is you know, Devil had me worked over pretty good because I'd smoke all the way to the church in a truck with the, oh, if I crack the window this far, you know, I won't smell like an ashtray. And then you do this number and you're, oh, yeah, obviously I smell like Febreze in here. Yeah, right. I'm so ashamed of it. But the Lord reminded me of something that I did to get break, break free from it is I would be out there those last few months smoking the cigarettes. I hate 
I hate the way it smells. I hate the way it tastes. I hate hawk and loogies. I hate it. I was using words to set me free. You can win the war of words. You can use words to win the war. In fact, they might be the key in your life. Now, in the world, you you want to talk about how much the devil's got this in a cinch? See, I remember the world. I I know it well, too well. (laughs) You, You hear it a lot of times in sports. This guy has not missed a field goal in two and a half years. Don't say that, Bill. Goes off to the side. What's that about? He said something positive, though, and the opposite happened. Think about it. Why why would that be a good outcome for the devil? Anybody ever been superstitious? I remember I was superstitious. And I felt like if I said what I wanted, I wasn't going to get it. Because the, the devil had me duped. He was winning the war of words. He tricked me with a superstition. And he'd use stupid stuff like field goals being missed to not say something. Because he knows that if you say the right things, you will be saved, set free, your name written in heaven. So he works overdrive to get you superstitious about the things that you, oh, don't say, you're not supposed to say that. You can't say that. Well, you know what? I say it. Think about it. Oh, well, you just say that. It won't come true. You, make, you blow out the candles. Don't share anybody what you're really wishing for. It won't come true. The war of words. Don't say it. It won't come true. You'll jinx it. I heard someone say that today, and so I lassoed them real quick. I threw them back in the pickup truck, and they're sitting right. It's the war of words. Because the devil is trying to psych you into thinking that if you say it, you'll spoil it so you won't say it, so you can't get set free, so you can't get safe, so you can't direct your life. It directs your life like a ship, like the rudder on the ship. You need your tongue. You need it sharp. You need it speaking the truth. You need it working for you, not against you. It can't be silent. You can't use no words. It has to be engaged. It leads the way like the the bridle on the horse. It's essential. Now I can use it to, I see it. It sets my life in action. Now when I say something, I see it come to pass. I will be there, and there's something that's, and I'm there. It's amazing. I, I, because I've learned and I've harnessed it, and it's subjected to God, and I'm, and I'm able to use it now as a, like a rudder to the ship. And then you know what you get? Then you get that biggest check mark. You get character, integrity. You want to learn to watch what you say? Follow through on all the commitments you've made, even if you don't want to do them anymore, even if it hurts. Well, by golly, just do it anyways. And maybe you'll learn not to run your mouth so much. So somebody told me, and it worked. Hallelujah. It all started with a spark. Hey, it would be really neat in an instructive way if we were able to take the things that we struggle with, the mountains in our lives, and go back to the first spark. Man, I pray right now, power of the Holy Spirit, that he will show us the areas. What was that spark? What was that word? What was said? What was done that got you on that track? What was the first thing? Because that forest fire 
By the way, I did not take that photo. I was not there. I was very far away, sleeping in my bed. That, that fire, that inferno was started with a spark. The tongue can be restless, evil, full of deadly poison. We, ble we bless the Lord and we curse people. You, you got to watch out if you're doing that. Blessing is to speak good. Curse is to speak bad. Let's just make it short and sweet. They're made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth came blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. It's what comes out of you that defiles you. They were like, hey, you didn't wash your hands. You're going to get COVID, Jesus. Your disciples are all going to get the flu. He said, yeah, and I'll heal them. And their immune system will be stronger for it. But watch what you say because it's what comes out that you speak defiles you. So there's, there's something, there's a difference, there's a line of delineation between what your thought is and what you say. We must give account for every thought? No, because not every thought is your thought. Those are the, the schemes and the flaming darts of the enemy and one of his tricks in the war of words is to get you to think that that was your thought in the first place. The audacity. What a liar. We don't have to give account for every thought. We have to give account for what we say. So you take every thought captive and you hold it up to the light. And you say, does this line up? And if you don't know the word, good luck, Chuck. You're on your own. You need to be in the word every day. And, if, and you hold it up and you say in one way or another. And you say, okay, does this line up? Is this God? Because God is love. Is this, is this, okay, I saw him do this with Job. And I saw him do this with Peter. And I, and I saw him do this, uh, you know, with, with Naaman the Syrian. Okay, does this line up? And I can't see right now, Hallelujah. Those are bright lights. It's from within that defiles. Look at the things that come. It all started inside, but when it comes out, the ones that are, that are speaking, deceit, slander, foolishness, could be either or. That's what defiles. Colossians says, put them all away. Put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. And I thought it was a funny joke today. And I thought it was pretty dang funny. And I was thinking about how to craft it to tell it to the guy I was working with. And I was like, you know what? I'm not supposed to tell that joke. Okay. And now that I think about it right now, I gave him a testimony first thing this morning about God moving in our finances so the devil probably would have taken that joke and said ah you see he's just like the rest of them he's just a hypocrite yeah. and I wouldn't even know because I'd have been oh I'm so funny over here look at me ha 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 and the devil would have used my words to spoil the testimony and the witness and the seeds that were sown in his heart if he has a heart just kidding he's a great guy don't lie to one another I had my kids memorize that one. And have uh, and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. You're being renewed after the image of your creator. That is quite fantastic. Man, if the world got a hold of that, they'd get off all their drugs. 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. So go ahead and just cancel that, you know, your to-do list for tomorrow to call those people and revile them. Amen. And return evil. I've heard a tooth for a tooth, you bastard. Don't do it. But on the contrary, bless. Speak good about them. It's hard, I know. Find something good to say or don't say it. Or at least put it in the proper context. Have a balanced view. And everybody doesn't need to know everything. 
Unless you're married, then they need to know everything. I think there's a different, I struggled that when we first got married. I'm like, is there, is there a different, I mean, I think there might be a different standard between husband and wife when it comes to, I don't know, we'll find out. I'll let you know if I can. <laughs> blessed, for you were called to be blessed, that you may obtain a blessing. What's the converse verse? Curse, that you may obtain a cursing. <laughs> It's not good. Bless it. God wants to bless you. He's just waiting for you to say something good so he can bless you. It's right there. He called you for it. He's like, I want to bless my kids. I want to give them good stuff. But if they're acting like spoiled, rotten brats, and they're being mean to each other and critical, I ain't going to give them anything. Whoever desires to love, love life, sign me up. Let's love some life. See good days. Sign me up. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Seek peace and pursue it because it's elusive. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Like That's a hard word. Like God is love. He says, nope. I'm all booked today. <laughs> My mercy's new tomorrow and do something good with it and then come back and we'll talk. Amen. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. But if you do right, you're blessing people. He's going to bless you. If you're biting your tongue, silence is No one's ever heard this verse, I'm sure. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love will eat its fruits. Amen, right? It can go either way. It's got the power to bless, to curse, to provide life, to provide death, conceal your fate. It can restore or change your fate like it did for me. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. You can have fulfillment and satisfaction in life, in your soul, in your being, by what you say. You can be satisfied by the yield of your lips. It can produce fruit in your lives. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. You ain't getting out. You ain't getting anywhere. You ain't getting them out. You want to argue with somebody? That's it. It's like the bars of a castle. It's, they're in there. You argue, their defenses go up. I mean, it's so funny. I think it's humorous because, like, in our, in, our, in our own minds, in our conceited selves, we're like, of course he's going to listen to me. Of course this is the best advice. Of course he's going to agree with me and understand my logic and wisdom and tell me I'm right and he's wrong. Fat chance in hell. Have you ever in a moment said, yeah, you know what? I've, what you're saying, you're right and I'm wrong. When you're arguing, that's quarreling. It's not going to work. Stop. Stop it. Stop arguing. Stop it. You're using the devil's words against someone. Stop it. Stop arguing. He wants you to disparage yourself, and then he wants you to disparage others. Oh, my son, he blah, 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 blah. My spouse, blah, 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 blah. My boss, blah, 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 blah. There you go. Sign up for the devil's army. He is the accuser of the brethren. So if you're accusing the brethren, then Jesus would say, you are like your father, the devil. And I say that unabashedly. He wants you to disparage yourself. He wants you to disparage others. And then ultimately, he wants you to disparage God. Why would God do this? Why? He doesn't love me. He won't heal me. He doesn't hear my prayers. Go ahead. Seal your fate. Take the lie of the enemy and blabber it out of your mouth and seal your fate. Please don't. I'm speaking sarcastically. Amen. 
This is what you're supposed to do. I don't know, God. What is going to happen? Speak to those dry bones. Those old, stinky, rank, ashy bones. Yeah, no life. Dead, twice dead, triple dead. He says, Lord, only you know. He said, prophesy. What's prophecy? Speaking for God. Speak to the bones. Say to them, oh, dry bones. <laughs> That's kind of funny, isn't it? Let's go have a conversation with these bones. Oh, dry bones. <laughs> well, you got God's sense of humor right there. Hear the word of the Lord. I like it's 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 calling forth ears. It's talking to him. You notice he called them dry bones. He didn't say alive and well bodies. He said it what it is. Don't get superstitious on me now with your spirituality that you won't even call it what it is. That dog is dead. That's a dead dog. No, he's asleep. He's going to be raised. Dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. I'm talking to you. Listen. This is a conversation. This is a war of words. I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. See how like the, the, the miracle here, there was a step-by-step -step progression that he used his words to bring forth the miracle. And in healing, it can work the same way where you can tell uh, blood flow to return. You can tell pain to cease. You can tell the nervous system to fire. You can speak to the ear and tell it to open. You could, that, that's how it works, right? This is what he's showing us. This is how it works. But there's a progression. He just didn't say, he just say, bones live. He said, hear me. The Lord says, you shall live. He draws it out step by step. He did what he said step by step. A sound and a rattling, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, the sinews were on them and the flesh, but there's no breath. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Speak to it. Speak specifically to the situation. Specifically. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. And he stood and he did what he said and there was a great army. When he ascended, he first descended, he went on high and he gave, took captivity captive, he gave gifts, apostles, prophets, and evangelists, Ephesians chapter 4, a, a fantastic, one of the most fantastic chapters in the Bible. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. That's why we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, is to build up, like Ezekiel built up that body, that literal body. He built up that army. When you're a prophet and you're a preacher, you're supposed to speak life into people to build them up. That's what the ministry is for, to equip the saints. To mature manhood, the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, words. Human cunning, words. Craftiness and deceitful schemes, words. It's a war of words. Rather, speaking the truth in love, it's a war of words. We are... To grow up in every way into him who is the head, Christ. No human is the head, by the way. Christ is the head. You have a body part, but you're not the head. Christ is the head. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint in which it is equipped. And when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's pretty cool if you ask me. That's a good picture. Let's keep moving. Therefore, having put away falsehood, words, 
Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Love is love, brother. Do what you want to do, man. See no evil, hear no evil. Nonsense. Acceptance is not love. Tolerance is not love. God is love. And the truth is, and boy, you better be bathed in prayer. You better be operating in the fruit of the Spirit. And you better be led by the Spirit before you go into a hornet's nest and you start batting around with a stick. Amen. Yeah, we all have enough sense not to go to a hornet's nest and hit it with a stick. But we do the same thing, in essence, with people in our lives. We want to blow it up. That's your ego. You're going to speak the truth in love. It's got to be bathed in prayer. you got to be hearing from God. And you know what? There are going to be times you, you ain't supposed to say nothing. There's been times in my marriage, I've been married 10 years. Amen. Send cards, offerings, flowers, chocolates. We'll take anything. We got three kids. We're poor. I, I don't say, I don't receive that. I was being facetious. And there were times that I wanted to say something so bad. And I was so right. Let's get in here. Let's tussle this out. Next thing, next morning, peace came. Lord's mercy. I slept on it. That's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. It's never as big a deal as you think it is. Not a big deal. Didn't say anything. You know, some of the greatest peace that you can experience is from not saying what you want to say, what you have to say. You don't have to say it. And since I mentioned it, I want to share it. Spiritually, when you're starting out, this is very important. Listen to what I'm going to have to say. If you're starting out in deliverance and spiritual warfare, and you're, and you're, on, you're beginning your progression to being healed, set free, and delivered, and all the good stuff like that. As they say in sports, the best offense is a great defense. And if you have a terrible defense, you're going to have a hard time outscoring the devil. Right? Because they're relentless. And there's an army. And you've got, you've got the Holy Spirit in you, and you can do that, and nothing's impossible with God. But I say it in those terms to, to bring it home that the best offense is a great defense and that if you're beginning spiritual warfare and you're in the war of words and you realize you've been losing and you need to start winning, I'm going to give you a phrase. I don't receive it. I was known for that phrase. Still am. <laughs> Not that I invented it, but I just used it so dang much. And we had a friend come visit us this last week, and he still remembers me by that. And I, I, I don't say it very much anymore. I said it tonight, and I say it to share it with you guys because I, I've gotten stronger in the Lord. And, I, you know, like that passage in Ephesians was talking about, and there's a maturity and there's a strength and there's an ability to roll with the punches as you, as you get stronger and stronger in Christ and you get more miles with the Lord. But before, there was a time I couldn't do that, that things would upset me. They would derail me negativity, criticism, you know. And in those times, what I started to do in order to stay guarded, guard your heart above all else, amen, I would say, I don't receive it. And I would even say it out loud. <laughs> it was kind of obnoxious to some people, I bet. But I needed to, to be guarded. And if they said something about me or sometimes even about something else, I'd say, I don't receive it. I wouldn't curl my nose, though. That's not polite. I'd say, I don't receive it. I don't receive it. I don't receive it. That thought comes in. I don't receive it. The doctor says something. Maybe say it under your breath. You can be polite. You don't have to be rude. I don't receive it. You say it in your heart. I don't receive it. I don't receive it. That right there. I'm telling you. Save you a heartache of trouble. On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. Are you hungry? Amen. C. 
seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Why? Because it was not the season for figs. But he was looking for figs. But he knew in the natural there would be no figs. Everything in the natural said no figs. It's too early. The latter rains haven't come. It's not that time of year. It's not the time of the harvest. And Jesus is hungry and he's saying, I want me some figs. I think I'm going to have some figs today. And so many times we get caught up in the natural. It's not my season. I'm too young. I'm too old. And we get caught up in the natural and we can read the sky. in the sign of the times and we miss the fact that Jesus wants some figs. He wants some fruit. He wants some life where there's no life. He wants it prematurely. You always say that he's uh, never early, never late, always on time. He was early here. This was like June. I'm not a farmer so don't Send emails to me, send them to Brother Mike. <laughs> Let's say the figs are supposed to come in October. It's June. I want some figs. I want some life. As they pass by, and, and then what does he say? May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Some of you, that's your word tonight. And you need to look in that thing in your life like I looked at those cigarettes and say, may no one ever see you again. May no one ever hear you again. May no one ever. You have that power. They passed by in the morning. They saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says this mountain be taken up, thrown in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. But believes that what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. That shadiness. that We're talking about darkness and light. So you can have faith and doubt. There can be shade. Just like there's shade in the natural world. Amen. It's not always noon. And if you have shade. If you have doubt in with your faith. You have to deal with the doubt. Amen. You have to repent. I'm sorry Lord. Get that doubt out. Use your words. Whatever you ask for in prayer, you will, it will be yours. Whatever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that you may be forgiven. What strikes me is this part. Right, this is probably one of my favorite sections because this right here, this 25, this is, a, this is a miracle maker. You forgive if you have anything against someone. That right there, that could turn the tide in your life. You stand praying. You stand praying tonight. You come up here. You want us to pray for you so you get deliverance and healing. Do you have anything against anyone? Deal with that first. And I'm not being mean. I'm just saying there's an order and a process with God. This isn't Circus Circus. This is not Chuck E. Cheese. This is the kingdom of God. There's an order. I love that part. But this part is so fascinating to me. He knew it wasn't the season. And it bothered him. Why? He wants the supernatural. He doesn't care about the natural. He doesn't care what the doctors say. He doesn't care what the other people say. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He wants the supernatural. He expects the supernatural. He's hungry tonight. He's hungry for a miracle. He's hungry for a healing. He says, I don't care. 
what the doctors say. I don't care. I don't care. He's hungry. He wants it. He expects it. He gets a little miffed when he doesn't get it. He cursed that fig tree so we could see that. Love the Lord, hate evil. Hate the sickness. Hate the insomnia. Hate the lust. Hate the addiction. Hate the pride. Hate the insecurity. Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. There's people out there, war words. Oh, God doesn't hate. Seven are abominations, six things the Lord hates. Love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of the saints. He delivers them. We can turn on the lights and we'll pray. Thank you for hearing me out tonight, and I pray that, uh, thank you, that that has been emblazoned on your soul, heart, and mind, that it is a war of words. Be careful what you say. Take every thought captive. Use your tongue like the mighty weapon it is to guide your life, to operate in the fullness of your calling, to build up the body in love, Resist the temptation to quarrel and fight and to demean and slander and all those things that are so tempting but so destructive. And we start right now with our words and we just say, Lord, we are sorry. Tell them you're sorry. Use your words. I'm sorry, Lord, for speaking negative about myself. I'm sorry for speaking negative about others. I'm sorry, Lord. Sorry, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Have mercy on my soul. I'm sorry, God, for the things I've said, for the fires I've started in my life and lives around me. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for the lies that I've spoken about others. I'm sorry for the lives that I've spoken about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for being in agreement with the accuser of the brethren. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for saying those things about my family. I'm sorry for saying the things about my finances. I'm sorry for saying the things about my life and who I am. I'm sorry. If you don't feel it, put your heart on your chest, Lord. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being careless with my speak. I'm sorry for being foolish in what I say. The Bible says, even a fool seems wise when he says nothing. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for being hasty in speech. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for identifying with the diagnosis or what the world says or the demonic schemes of the enemy. I'm sorry, Lord. Have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on my soul. Have mercy on me, Lord. And what I'm going to ask you to do next goes back to the very beginning of creation. The first chapter of Genesis. Have dominion. Subdue those things in your life. Subdue them. Have dominion. You may want to stand up. You may walk around. You might want to get some action and activity so you can spread around. Have dominion, subdue, have authority on this earth. That's what you were called to do over every living thing, spirits included. And James it says that every animal, every creature was tamed by the tongue. That's what he's calling you to do. You tell that thing to stop. You tell that thing to be bound. You tell that thing to come out. You tell that heart to, to function properly like uh, Ezekiel did to the dry bones. Hear, O oh mind. Hear, O oh soul. Hear, O oh heart. Hear, O oh back. Thus saith the Lord. Function properly. Move. Walk. Think properly in the mighty name of Jesus. 
Come on, I can't do this for you. I'm just leading the way. You are an army and the soldier of God. You need to get in the fight. You need to be able to fight. I won't be with you tomorrow. The ministry team won't be with you tomorrow. You'll have the Holy Spirit, but now is the time you get your feet wet. You stand up. You stand up. You say to that mountain, be removed and cast into the sea in the mighty name of Jesus. I rebuke you, you liar, you intimidator. Lord, I'm sorry. Come on, stand up and fight somebody. God's got a plan for your life and a calling and a purpose and a future, but you got to get engaged. You got to do it. He is in you. You are able. Come on, if you want someone to pray for you, raise your hand. The prayer team will come and pray for you. If you feel something moving, if you feel pressure, if you feel pain, lay hands on yourself. Tell it to cease in the name of Jesus. I command you to stop. Halt in the name of Jesus. I bind you in the name of Jesus. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in the heavens. God is fighting for you in the heavens by the power of the Holy Spirit and the host of heaven's armies binding those things, those forces, those spiritual forces of darkness that are operating in your lives. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I bind you mental illness. I bind you drug addiction right now. I hate you in the name of Jesus. I hate it in the name of Jesus. I hate the evil. I hate the, the words that have been used against me. I hate the lies of the enemy. I hate being sick. I hate being poor. I hate being alone. Right now, in Jesus' name. Right now. I hate it. I hate the insomnia. I hate the perversion. Come on now, fight. Fight, fight, fight. Come on, it's worth it. I hate it. I hate the tobacco. I hate the booze and the alcohol. Right now, in Jesus' name. Get out in Jesus' name. I hate it. Get out of here right now. In Jesus' name. Let me go. Come on, you fight. Stand up. Get uncomfortable. I hate the insecurity. I hate the fear of rejection. In Jesus' mighty name, go in Jesus' name. Get out in Jesus' name. Tell it what to do.